Hello, my name is Shryan Jarudi, and today I want to talk to you about re-envisioning the architecture of schooling in an online era. For centuries, a variety of different learning environments have emerged. And the differences in these learning environments, or the architecture of schooling, can influence the kinds of interactions that take place and the kinds of learning that might take place. For example, the learning environment might influence how engaged students are, including whether some of them might even fall asleep, as well as whether the instructor or the teacher plays the role of a sage on the stage, or perhaps the role of a guide on the side. It can also influence the types of interactions that students might have with their peers, or whether it's even easy to have interactions with one's peers. Therefore, the architecture of schooling influences the kinds of learning that take place and perhaps the efficacy of learning that take place in different learning environments. More recently, we found uh, the, that there's an, a new emergence of active learning classrooms, especially in higher education institutions, such as a few shown here. These classes are designed to facilitate or to foster active learning, which means that students are able to not just aren't just listening to the instructor teach as a sage on the stage, but are actually taking control of some aspect of the learning. As we see in these active learning classrooms, uh, there are several common features that, that exist in them. For example, students are uh, sitting around small tables with a few of their peers, maybe two to four peers, uh, any given table. And each table is often equipped with its own uh, screen, which might display the uh, presentation the teacher showing, as shown in the example here, but they could also potentially be used for students to share things on their own devices so they can collaborate with, uh, with one another at their table using their shared screen. Many of these classrooms also have whiteboards scattered around the classroom, or perhaps whiteboards uh, for each table where students can collaborate with one another. Therefore, these classrooms are designed to facilitate certain kinds of learning. For example, at my own institution, the University of California, Irvine, they constructed a, a new building called the Ant Eater Learning Pavilion in 2018, prim solely to foster active learning. And as, as it states here, it's California's first academic building, building fully dedicated to active learning. And they did some research to see, well, you know, is this building actually changing anything? And they found that in 61% of uh, active learning classrooms that were observed, they did actually find active learning take, taking place. Whereas in traditional classrooms, uh, only 45% of the time, they found active learning taking place. So again, it's not to say that active learning is always happening. In fact, students can use these classrooms uh, solely to teach in a traditional style. Also, students, uh, teachers, Sorry, teachers can use uh, active learning classrooms to teach in a more traditional style, but they can also use traditional classrooms to teach uh, in a way that fosters active learning. But based on other aspects of the research conducted, it seems like the active learning classrooms facilitate the ability for faculty to actually use these classrooms to uh, enable active learning. It might be much more difficult in a traditional classroom to do certain kinds of activities than it might be in these active learning classrooms. Students' perception of these classrooms was also that, um, at least uh, on average, students found the active learning classrooms to uh, enhance their learning in a variety of ways as well. None of this says that necessarily the students are actually learning more, right? Other research has to confirm that, and there is a variety of research showing the benefits of active learning, which is outside the scope of this talk. But at the very least, this shows that the architecture of schooling uh, in this modern era can actually influence the kinds of activities that can take place and the ability of instructors to facilitate learning in, in ways that they might want to. Perhaps active learning classrooms are one of the, the latest uh, fads in, in re-envisioning the architecture of schooling, which has been an area that, that people have been interested in for decades. For example, there was a, a burst of research in the 60s and 70s on the architecture of schooling and how we can re-envision the, the types of classrooms and types of schools that students are learning in. Here's one uh, example of work from that era. This is a paper from Robert Eberly in 1969 titled The Open Space School. He begins his paper by quoting Winston Churchill, we shape our institutions 
And thereafter, our institutions shape us, which is very much in line with this idea that the architecture of schooling that we design can then sort of design and influence the kinds of learning that take place in those schools. He then goes on to uh, describe what this open space school is by stating the basic design for the open space school makes provision for a series of non-partitioned teaching stations, or if you please, instructional spaces. The overall enclosure provides square footage equal to or greater than an equivalent number of classrooms in a traditionally designed school. So in a sense, it's basically like a traditional school, but perhaps with the walls removed. And now instead of thinking of traditional classrooms that are isolated from one another, they're instructional spaces and students are sort of free to, and teachers are free to move between these spaces when needed. And you can see the kinds of uh, activities taking place in, in, in other spaces nearby. Now, some might say this, this might lead to distraction, perhaps as a negative thing, but in this paper, Eberly goes on to state why this school might be promising. One of the things he states is that uh, individuality can best be respected and cultivated when the teacher's role shifts from familiar sage on the stage to the helping relationship of a guide on the side. I already referred to these terms earlier. These are common terms that are used to describe different roles that the instructor might play. He then goes on to say that the open space school is pupil centered and that multiple learning routes provide pupils with the opportunity to learn in ways that best suit them as individuals. In fact, this phrase, uh, this comparison between sage on the stage and guide on the side, uh, the earliest work that I could actually find referring to this was this paper, uh, which was envisioning how the architecture of schooling can change, can cause this shift from one mode of instruction to another. As important as the architecture of schooling is, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw that suddenly all of schooling had to shift online in a way that might look like this, or perhaps more accurately, might look like this. And in these you know, spaces, we lose a lot of what, a lot of the possibilities that might've existed in physical spaces, whether active learning classrooms or even traditional classroom environments, where teachers can do a variety of things that involve the physical space that would be at the very least difficult to do in these online spaces even seeing whether students are engaged or asleep, as shown by the second uh, image, could be more difficult in these online spaces. So this raises a question of, can we re-envision the architecture of schooling when, le when learning takes place online, right? If environments like Zoom sort of constrain the kinds of learning and the kinds of interactions that can take place, can we think more creatively about how to foster better kinds of learning the question comes up, how do we even think about an architecture of schooling when we remove the aspect of physical space where architecture is normally, normally conceived of? One answer to this uh, question, which I want to talk about for the rest of this talk, is environments like Gather. Gather is a, the juxtaposition of a video conferencing tool with a game-like spatial environment where people can interact. And rather than just talking about what Gather is, I'm going to actually show you. But as I go throughout the rest of the talk, feel free to actually try it out for yourself. You can go on to this uh, link, gather.town, and, and, and see what it's like for yourself as you watch and listen uh, to the rest of this presentation. So hello. Now you're seeing my face for the first time. So I'm going to show you uh, some learning environments that I uh, you know, built myself in Gather just to show you the variety of different kinds of uh, architectures of schooling that we can actually envision and gather. And this is just a sampling. This might not even be the most interesting, uh, you know, example of the kinds of spaces that we can see. So let's get started. So we're now in Aldrich Park. This is actually sort of a map of uh, my, my institution, the University of California, Irvine. And I created this space by just actually um, taking uh, an, uh, an image uh, of the campus that, was, that actually existed and sort of uploading it. So I didn't actually draw all of this. And so as we move around, we can see the variety of buildings that exist on campus. So walk through parking lots. And you know, as I hit a building, I reach a stumbling block. So I have to move around it. Right. Oh, and here we see it says that the class is in here. So let's walk into this building. 
you might recognize the name of this building. It's the Anteater Learning Pavilion, where, um, as I mentioned, the active learning classrooms uh, on our campus are. And the reason I chose to put our classroom in this building is because I actually taught in this building before the pandemic happened. And so I wanted to recreate the actual classroom environment that students would have been in had they uh, not been learning online. This is actually a hallway. It, it, it's meant to loosely represent the actual hallway that exists in this building, where you know when students enter the building, uh, before they enter their classrooms, there is a variety of seating environments where students can can talk or, or work. Um, I also put some some games in here. Uh, so I think this one is oh, this one's a drawing game. Here we see a board game, code names. So if students want, they can play this. And in reality, I don't think I've had students actually play these games, but um, you can you can see why you know this might be useful to have in certain environments where you might ha want to have students engage uh, uh, with, um, you know, uh, playing games during during a more social hour, uh, uh, which might, you know, exist in, in traditional classroom environments, especially in K through 12, where sometimes the teacher might have students uh, playing games for the day, uh, you know, after maybe after uh, testing, for example. This is the actual classroom. Uh, so here's a podium where the instructor can stand. And here are a variety of stations. This is, again, modeled after uh, the active learning classroom uh, that I actually taught in. Uh, so we have these tables. Uh, there are four to five uh, uh, chairs per table. So students can, can uh, join each other in, uh, around small, small groups. And they can have you know, discussions with their group. And what you see is when you actually enter the space around the table, you see that it gets highlighted. And this is where uh, one of the really powerful aspects of Gather comes in, which is that students can actually have local conversations. These spaces that are highlighted are called private spaces, meaning that if I'm standing outside of the private space, I can't hear the conversation that's taking place in the private space. Similarly, students can also use the chat. And if they chat nearby, if I'm further away or if I'm not in the private space, uh, I won't be able to see the chat that actually takes place there. One of the other nice features of this is that on the tables, when you, uh, if the student actually presses X, they can actually see something that I might put there. For example, in this case, I put a collaborative document at the table so the students can actually collaborate with one another uh, on this document. Uh, and, and only the students at that table would be able to collaborate on that document, as long as you know, I, I uh, put different documents on each table, which I can, I can readily do. Or for example, I, I often use Google Forms. I might put a Google Form. This is actually one that I use in my class. Uh, and I put it at the table so students can uh, easily access and complete the form at the table. So in this way, the classroom was sort of designed to facilitate active learning tasks that might uh, require students to work together uh, in groups and, and discuss with one another in groups. So just taking a step back, we can already see sort of a difference from a traditional Zoom environment where in Zoom, it is possible to create breakout rooms for students to, to collaborate with one another and to discuss with one another. But I think it's a little bit more clunky and it's less organic than this environment. Actually, one of the most powerful things about this environment, I, I think, is that students can choose where to sit, which they would do in a normal classroom. That concept doesn't even exist in Zoom. So that's already one way that we're sort of enabling a new architecture of schooling. Well, actually, really an old one that existed traditionally, but at least new for this uh, for online environments. So once students enter the classroom, they can choose where to sit. And you know, during group activities, they can just talk to their peers. In fact, students can actually talk to one another at their tables while I might be presenting uh, you know, uh, a lecture, which is something that students can totally do in, in traditional classroom environments, but doesn't exist in platforms like Zoom. So there's something missing here, uh, which is students. So let me bring in some students, uh, fake students. OK, now we have a couple of students, student A and student B. One of the things you'll notice is that when student B is speaking, you can actually see a speech bubble appearing over uh, uh, his head. Um, you, you also see that I can see the videos because I'm spotlighted, which means when I'm at the podium, I can actually see the videos of all the students, typical to perhaps uh, many Zoom classrooms. My students have chosen not to have their videos on. Uh, but let's see if we can change that. Oh, OK, there we see student B's video, uh, which happens to look remarkably like a mirror image of myself. Uh, and, and one thing that, that you'll notice is that the video quality is not great on Gather. This is one limitation. Uh, you, can, you can manipulate the video quality. You can uh, increase the size of the video if you want to see the speaker. But uh, it's not as great as Zoom. 
But one question to ask is whether that really matters much. Do, you know, do the pros outweigh the cons? And, and different people might have different answers to that question. Uh, but you know, there are certain affordances here uh, that where you can actually see certain kinds of um, uh, body language, so to speak, that you wouldn't normally be able to see on Zoom. So even even if the video quality is less, for example, uh, you see that student B uh, reacted uh, with a thumbs up. Uh, student A chose to give a heart, right? So you can see certain things. You can also see where the students are. You can see when students are moving around, um, which might be useful depending on the kinds of activities you might have in the classroom. All right, let's move. Let's let's take a look at another classroom. Bye, students. Here's another classroom that I've uh, created. Uh, you'll notice that this is not an, not really an active learning classroom. It's it's like a traditional classroom. In fact, it's designed to be um, an early 1900s kind of traditional classroom uh, uh, environment. And the reason I made this was because I was giving a, a lecture sort of on on uh, the early history of educational technology, and um, I wanted students to sort of get into a different environment to get a feel for the the era that we were uh, maybe talking about. And um, I did, however, do something a little bit different than you would have in a traditional classroom. So when students are seated here, uh, you know, uh, the instructor can't hear them because they're not spotlighted. Uh, but to, to sort of uh, work around the fact that, you know, students would typically raise their hand and they, they would get called on. What I did is if the students step to the right, they actually get spotlighted, which, can, which you can see with the small globe that appears uh, next to my video. So I did this so students can, can easily step up and, and speak up, especially for one of the activities I wanted in the class. I wanted students to be able to do that. Otherwise, students wouldn't be able to easily uh, speak up in class. Let me show you a different classroom. So I'm going to show you a different environment that I've used in my class. So this is actually uh, used for a poster session. Uh, I, do, I do this at the end of my class when I want students to present posters on the projects. So what you'll notice is as we walk around, what we can actually see different posters that students created. And when we, if we go into one of these spaces, we can actually enlarge the poster to, to see the, um, the, the, the student's poster. We can, we can view them. And students can, can be standing here and present their posters as needed. Uh, as many people who have used the other poster sessions have found is that this experience really fairly well recreates the experience of a, a real life poster session. Um, and, and my students, this is, this is one of the aspects of Gather that my students in particular really liked. Um, when uh, when they were uh, presenting the projects. Let me show you one other classroom. So this is one last classroom that I want to show you. This is actually used uh, for my PhD class. And I wanted to have it be more uh, more like a seminar style classroom. So students would, would typically sit around this big table. And once they do, they're spotlighted, which means that everyone can hear everyone um, you know, who's speaking. Right? So you don't have to raise your hand, and, and I don't have to to call on you, so to speak, but students can just, just interject as needed. Uh, however, I also wanted the ability for students to, to, to work together for, for small activities as in an active learning classroom. So I set up these tables, which as you see, when the, when the student walks in, it's, it's a private space that can, they can house up to four people, uh, but you know, tip often would have like two people per table as, as designated with the chairs. So this just gives you an idea of the different kinds of classrooms they can recreate. And in this case, I've taken inspiration from actual types of classrooms that I've seen. Although in this case, I sort of combined two different classroom layouts into the same classroom, which you might not normally see in, in, in uh, physical classrooms. Uh, but one of the other really powerful things about Gallery is, well, first of all, I created all these spaces. And I can show you how I created it. But uh, there's actually a map maker tool. But beyond the map maker tool, you can actually modify the environment in real time. So let me just um, choose to add some, some new kind of furniture. Or maybe I want to add uh, a, uh, a larger table, for example. Uh, I can do that here. I can, maybe I want to add one here too. Right? Choose to add chairs around the table. I can choose to put inter interactive things. Maybe I want to put a game of Tetris somewhere. Right. So I can change the environment of the classroom in simple ways by adding new furniture, by adding new interactive things, adding websites that students can interact with, adding whiteboards, for example, in real time to sort of change uh, things that students can do. This is actually quite powerful, I think, because it allows for 
re-envisioning the architecture of schooling in ways that would actually be quite difficult to do in a traditional schooling environment. We'll come back to that point in a moment. But first, I just want to share some anecdotes about how students actually felt using Gather. So I just want to share with you a few uh, quotations from students when I ask them about uh, the use of technology in, in my class. Uh, generally, many students commented on the use of Gather, which was one of several things that they, they could have talked about. Uh, and here are just a few quotations that students shared. I really like working on Gather, having tables, being able to walk around and present the way we did. It allowed school to feel a little bit more normal during this distance learning. So basically just the fact that they were in sort of a campus, in a classroom setting, they were able to choose where they sit, just felt like a, a sort of a little closer to uh, what it would, it would have been like in person. Uh, it was less maybe about the affordances that the environment provided and more just about the fact that it was sort of like an environment that looked like a classroom, it looked like school, while uh, platforms like Zoom do not. It was an innovative way to have students participate and felt more like a community than Zoom would have. Again, now it's not just about the environment, but the fact that it gives a community-like feel when you're sitting around students. You feel like you're in the presence of other students, whereas with Zoom, it might feel a little bit more disconnected. To start, even though I was unable to attend the lectures, I love that you incorporated Gather to connect us as a class. I loved watching these lectures because it was so much more interesting than watching just the Zoom recording. This educational technology connected the class by making it feel more like a classroom. I find this comment particularly interesting because this student didn't actually attend the classes, but watched recordings of the, the classes uh, as it, they took place on Gather. And simply watching the recordings of a class that was in an environment that felt more like a classroom was more powerful to the student because it felt a bit more connected, like maybe even like they were almost in the classroom, even though they couldn't participate, than if they were to watch me lecturing or just watch a recording of a Zoom class. And in this case, the students said that they didn't like it at first, but they got used to it over time. And they say the only problem was peer participation of the features. Uh, I thought it would have been cool to use the proximity chat to just talk to my table, but I was too shy myself. And this reflects a limitation that I did see, which is that students weren't really taking advantage of the features that I thought um, could make Gather more powerful, like the fact that they could communicate around the table with their peers, even while I'm speaking, which students would feel comfortable doing in a real environment. And this is an open question of whether we can mitigate these challenges, but I think it comes down to in, uh, creating a culture of the kind of environment that you want uh, students to be in, right? It's not enough to create the architecture of the schooling, but it also requires creating a new culture of schooling. And students who are used to Zoom settings might still take on their practices that they, they carried over from Zoom. It requires additional work on behalf of an instructor and the students to create the culture of the classroom that they want to have. And this is something that I, I feel like I haven't been successful yet, but perhaps others can think about ways to do this um, to enable powerful learning environments. I'd like to conclude with this thought. As I mentioned earlier, Gather enables the ability to rapidly change the environment, to create new environments, like the few I showed you, but perhaps even more powerful environments or more unique and creative environments in ways that would be very difficult to do in a physical space. So I think that not only does Gather enable us to sort of move away from the limitations of being in an online space like Zoom, where we don't have the affordances of various architectures of schooling, but perhaps it actually gives us the ability to experiment with different architectures of schooling. In a physical space, we might have to put millions of dollars, as many people have, just to create new buildings and new active learning classrooms. And that's just to create a specific type of classroom that many higher education institutions are doing. But what other types of classrooms can we create? And what are the affordances those classrooms have? It's very difficult to ask that question because it might require creating new classrooms, which we'd have to put a lot of money in, at least in the physical space. But on tools like Gather, in virtual spaces, we can easily create new spaces. An instructor can do that. You don't even need a programmer. In this case, an instructor can come in and create a new space, try it out for a day, for a week, or for a quarter, without putting much time or much money into it. Therefore, perhaps, and this is an open question, it's up for discussion, but perhaps digital environments give us the opportunity to re-envision the architecture of schooling in ways that are difficult to do in the physical space. I open you to and I invite you to think about this question and see if there are ways that we can work together towards exploring new architectures of schooling.
in a digital era. Thank you.